And welcome to the Vonnie Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to the coercion of the state and the servile society. I'm your host, Shane, coming to you from the Veritas node of the Free Republic of Pasnia. Uh, today, we revisit a topic I uh, never thought we would cover at all on this, po- on this podcast, uh, at least until TVP intermission number 53, when I briefly covered a Kerry Thornley connection to Lee R. V. Oswald. And uh, despite unknowingly stumbling across this area, little did I know how then, uh, little did I know, did I know then uh, how fucking far this all went. Uh, not, only, not only that, but this is one conspiracy I gave very little time to. Uh, it was so long ago, and there's no way that I, that I had the time or interest to go as deep as was necessary. Uh, I realized that very on, very early on in my path. I got a couple of books, JFK books, and then I realized there were like a couple thousand out there, and I had, had no idea where to start from there. So, um, yeah, the Circa 2012, and I, just, I really didn't think I'd see an answer in my lifetime at all. Um, which is, uh, yeah, until a couple uh, a couple of weeks ago when I stumbled across the work of Corey Hughes uh, on the Rogue Ways, uh, on, on Rogue Ways with previous guest uh, Lindsay Sharman. Uh, again, usually I would never click on a podcast talking about JFK, but I had a, I had a little thought. Uh, you know, wonder, I wonder if I'll go into, uh, into uh, Carrie Thornley at all. And uh, yeah, within the span of like five minutes, uh, I knew I was onto something significant historically, uh, but also in relevance to this niche of Vanu uh, and self liberation that we find ourselves in. So to introduce it in brief, an editor to innovator in Ocean Freedom Notes, colleague of Rayo, and contributor to the realm of liberation, Kerry Thornley, uh, not only knew Leo Harvey Oswald, but uh, may have been one of the folks impersonating him, uh, setting, up, setting, setting him up across the country, uh, knowingly or unknowingly, we can talk about that. Um, but further, Kerry just may have been involved in the murder of a police officer, uh, J.D. Tippetts, and, uh, and just from my perspective, uh, seemed to, he seemed to be, protect, be protected at the uh, highest levels. Uh, even later in his life, he started to believe that he may have been set up as another patsy uh, if it was needed or that he was a victim of MK Ultra mind control experimentation, uh, some of his own words will attest to uh, in some coming excerpts. Uh, in terms of conclusions, what this means historically and personally uh, pertaining to Kerry, I'm not so sure, but hopefully our guest today, Corey Hughes, uh, will be able to give us some answers. And I guess just one of the relevant note personally, uh, this theme has come up uh, in my path before. Um, <clears throat> some may recall an old colleague, uh, Gary Hunt. Uh, well, Gary was accused of being Jando number three. I think it was number three in the Oklahoma City bombing by Bill Cooper, actually, uh, back in the 90s. Uh, Gary cleared his name uh, later on, I think, sufficiently. Uh, relating to here, I'd just be curious to find out what a top-notch investigator like Corey would find in that event, too. Uh, kind of seems like the same modus operandi, just mass confusion uh, and chaos. But anyway, that's for another time. Uh, without further ado, Corey, uh, welcome to the Monty Podcast, man. Uh, how are you today? How are you today? <clears throat> I'm good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no problem at all. No problem at all. So, um, yeah, I guess that kind of gives a little introduction to where, where we're coming from here. Um, and, uh, um, yeah, I'm, I'm excited again to the JFK and obviously the Carrie Thornley stuff, too. But I guess just to begin, um, since you are a new voice to my audience, um, why don't you start with an introduction? Uh, who are you? Uh, what do you do? And uh, you know, what got you all uh, really deep into this research? Sure. Uh, my name is Corey Hughes. I am a historian and I have been... Uh, doing historical research since about 2015. Um, I do mostly full-time research, uh, although I do run a podcast publishing company. I work with Chris Matthews of Forbidden Knowledge News. Uh, But uh, for the most part, most of my time uh, for the last four, four and a half years has been on the Kennedy assassination. And that's pretty much, uh, in my opinion, it's the most important event in American history. It's one of the most important events in world history. And uh, it was just sick and tired of uh, people uh, kicking the king down the road. It's been 60 years. Hundreds of books have been written on the subject and not a single goddamn person has come up with any answers. And I was just sick of it. Um, I was a cop for about eight and a half hours. Uh, I've got thousands of hours of training and experience in actual investigations. And so when I approached the Kennedy assassination, I did it with a background in actually knowing what what I was doing as far as researching um, and putting together a criminal case. And I think that's one of the big problems with most of the Kennedy researchers out there is they don't have any kind of real training or background in investigations. Because I look at some cases or some some incidents within the Kennedy assassination where the, you know, looking at it from the perspective of a cop, the evidence is clear that it points at one particular person. But, you know, the Kennedy research community will uh, debate and bicker back and forth uh, for 50 years till the mu- the waters are so muddied, nobody has any idea what they're talking about in the first place. Um, and then that I have no doubts as part of some COINTEL pro infiltration. Um, I mean, I know this is to be the case because I've been banned from every JFK forum, Facebook group, you name it. Uh, I, am, I, I cannot participate in any of those uh, because uh, as soon as I start talking about who was really behind the assassination, and as soon as I start correcting people who think they knew what they were talking about, who've been doing this for 40 years, uh, they didn't really appreciate that. And so, yeah, uh, I don't get uh, a warm welcome in any of the JFK or historical research groups. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, uh, I guess certainly, yeah, certainly, uh, um, 
yeah, I guess it, it is what it is. But uh, um, yeah, we're glad to have you here mm-hmm. to, 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 um, to to talk about it. So I guess uh, um, yeah, let's go ahead and get into it. And, and your seven hour amazing JFK presentation, which I've I've probably watched a few times a few times by now, um, in the past uh, week. You and made half, it through so. the whole thing. Yeah, made, multiple times. See, yeah. I always wonder if people. I wonder if people can never make it through the whole thing. No, not so, in one sitting. Obviously, it's, it's but, a long watch. Yeah, I mean, it, it took me over the course of like probably three days to go through it three times, but. Um, but yeah, um, yeah, it was great. Pre- and I, I went through a couple of your other ones too, uh, right, that, you, that you have on, on your uh, channel. I'm not sure if they're ones that you did, but they're ones that are up there at least. But, uh, um, I mean, uh, yeah, in that, in that documentary on JFK, you, you harp on a couple of necessary points of understanding, which I think are important for our, I guess our, our background here. Um, one is that world war one and world war two are necessary prerequisites, uh, to understanding the JFK assassination, uh, and really even our world today. And alongside that, an understanding mm-hmm. of psychological warfare, uh, and its use over the 20th century. Um, now, the other is that when it comes to JFK, looking at connections between individuals is the key, not looking at like, uh, you know, all the, I guess all the evidence per se, but just looking at the connections. <laughs> right. So um, I guess right. that's, th- those are kind of some important, important things I think we should, I guess, uh, yeah, if you could just kind of lay out that and give, give us a little framework for mm-hmm. um, our understanding here. Yeah, no, you just picked out some like incredible points that I always wonder if people will catch uh, that you picked out some of definitely some of the most important things, the relationships between people is everything. Um, if you don't understand the relationships, you will not be able to interpret the evidence. Uh, like particularly with Carrie Thornley, there's a lot of obfuscation around New Orleans and Carrie Thornley between 1960 and 1963, because he does uh, travel a bit uh, in that time pr- period, but he is mostly based out of New Orleans. And they went to great lengths to hide the relationship that he had with Clay Shaw and David Ferry. But you know, between 61 and 63. Him and David Ferry had been roommates for a time, and they, uh, Carrie Thornley had been living with David Ferry in the early part of 1963, um, which connects us back to like the party with Perry Russo, uh, where he claims to have met Oswald, going under the alias Leon Oswald. But he claimed that Oswald uh, was uh, had whiskers, and that when he had met him previously, he had a big bushy beard, right? He was a bearded beatnik, is how he described him. And so when you I come to understand the relationships between the people down in New Orleans. It's obvious there's only one bearded beatnik in the cast of characters, and that's Carrie Thornley. And he was Ferry's roommate for a time. So two plus two equals four. This really isn't rocket science. It really just takes, you know, common sense analysis of the facts. And see, this is one point that has been still debated for the last 60 years. It drives me up a goddamn wall. Um, it was pretty easy to determine that was Carrie Thornley. And once you understand that Carrie Thornley and David Ferry are very tight, you can start to plug in some of the Oswald sightings around New Orleans uh, as Carrie Thornley, particularly because of locations. There were certain Oswald sightings at certain bars that Carrie Thornley was known to frequent, right? So, but yeah, they knew each other. Um, uh, Carrie Thornley knew Marina, and the fact that he knew Marina uh, and was very familiar with both of them kind of connected some of the Oswald sightings in Dallas that didn't make sense to be Oswald. Some of the sightings uh, involving Marina and a child uh, where Oswald was driving, even a couple incidents where he was seen like out next to a freeway shooting a rifle at bales of hay, right? Uh, uh, with a with a woman and a child. So you know that it's not Oswald. And so when you start to understand the relationships and the connections, uh, it becomes obvious who is where and what's what. Uh, I mean, I don't want to say it's obvious because it took me years to be able to put all this stuff together. Um, But once you actually see it, it's like, wow, how how can everybody not see it? You know? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I guess I can, um, I I mentioned to you before we started that I had um, ordered, um, there's a book called Caught in the Crossfire, Carrie Thornley, Lee Oswald, and the Garrison Investigation by Adam Go Rightly. And for me, whenever I whenever I look into a subject like Vani or anything, I like to go back to the original source material because that's the best place to start. And this book has like original, le- or I guess, letters from Carrie throughout, um, you know, throughout I guess twenty or thirty years. And um, there's one section here. I guess this is because uh, he was um, he pretty much went nuts by the end of all this. Um, which I, I which I guess if you read this book, it kind of it, it, it makes sense. But he he wrote a letter to the I guess the psych- psych- psychiatry I guess the hospital. And uh, this is just one part, um, and uh, and again, it, 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 it confirms some of the stuff that you, some of the stuff that you've, I guess, uh, that you point out in your research. But he says, "quote I point out to Dr. M that with no effort on my part at all, I've met an unusually large number of accused JFK assassins. I was a college fraternity pledge, brother of Gordon Novel, a suspect in the Garrison probe. I was in the Marines with Lee Harvey Oswald. In New Orleans, on separate and apparently unconnected occasions, I met Guy Bannister." David Ferry and Clay Shaw, Garrison's three main suspects, before the assassination. A few weeks before the assassination, I discussed killing Kennedy with David Chandler, a stringer for Life magazine who was also on Garrison's suspect list. 
After the assassination in 1968, I met Jim Garrison, and as a result of that, spent some time in the same room with Marina Oswald, both accused by various critics of covering up the assassination conspiracy. Later that year, the next in New Orleans, I jumped in a taxi cab driven by Garrison's star witness, Perry Raymond Russo. In 19, <laughs> we're not done yet. Hold on. In 1966, in connection with my duties as editor of Libertarian Newsletter, I met Warren Carroll, accused by May Russell of an involvement in the Kennedy assassination and the Nazi connection to the John F. Kennedy assassination. Um, Carroll was H.L. Hunt's propaganda writer, and his leaflets were found in Jack Ruby's car, among other considerations mentioned. That same year, independent of any of these meetings, I met Mafia Don jo uh, Johnny Rosselli, accused in a skeleton key mm -hmm. to the Gemstone Files by St uh, Stephanie Caruna, of firing the fatal shot from the grassy knoll that actually killed the president. If I believe that I've met eight accused assassins that three, that, and three accused accessories after the fact by coincidence, then I would be crazy, and I can find myself to the officially accused. At least four others I have met have been accused in private conversations with people who seem to know uh, what they were talking about, in quotes. So... Um, anyway, and like, and we can get more into Carrie Thornley, but it's just like, just that, like that quick, like, yeah, there's a lot of connections with Carrie Thornley, um, automatically just right off mm -hmm. the, right off the front. So, um, I guess, uh, let's, let's, um, I guess any thoughts on that before I, I guess, before I kind of take us forward on what, what I just read. Yeah, that's, that's, that's killer. Um, I'm going to need to pick that book up. Um, that's, uh, that's some good stuff right there. See, so Carrie Thornley. I'm not. I'm not by any means an expert on Kerry Thornley. All of my research on him is based with an information in the uh, FBI or Garrison or uh, Harold Weisberg files, right? So all of my knowledge of him is directly Kennedy specific. But a lot of the stuff with Garrison, the investigations, uh, you know, even past the Clay Shaw trial, it continued on into the '70s, right? So mm -hmm. um, later on, Garrison had picked up a lot of Kerry Thornley's other work and kind of documented it in his own notes. So even though it's years past Kennedy, it did fall into the, the garrison files of, of the, his Kennedy research. So it saved me some time, but Kerry Thornley is, uh, when you read the, the garrison files on Thornley, that freaking guy, uh, I mean, he wouldn't know the truth if it was choking him to death. Um, that is true. That's a true statement. <laughs> He contradicts himself like every other word. He is uh, he obviously has intelligence counter interrogation training. Um, you know, when you follow him back into the Marines in 59, it seems as though as early as 59, he was shadowing Oswald in the Marines. Um, uh, he was in the same location as Oswald at least three times. Uh, they had to have known each other. Uh, I have evidence that, and this is in the Garrison files, so it's not really uh, anything secret or hidden, but uh, he was using uh, the alias of Rick Thornley um, in Atsugi, uh, posing as a photographer and reporter that was keeping tabs on Oswald's particular unit out there. So there was, he was definitely, he was not doing this of his own volition, right? So he's obviously connected to intelligence going back to 59. Uh, and that's another uh, distinction I need to make here with some of these cast of characters in New Orleans, right? So you can kind of see the hierarchy of how these operatives work together. Uh, Clay Shaw and David Ferry had both been CIA since 47, and both probably were involved with the OSS prior to that. So they were, but they were recruited independently, right? They, it wasn't like Clay Shaw recruited David Ferry. And so it's the same thing with Kerry Thornley. Kerry Thornley was independently recruited. He wasn't recruited by David Ferry to be in his little group, right? But then you can look at all the other guys who were surrounding David Ferry, and most of them were ones that he had recruited from the Civil Air Patrol and, uh, you know, just guys, he, uh, kids he hung around with in New Orleans who weren't really CIA agents, but were, you know, working with him, and he was most certainly working with the CIA. So, but yeah, Kerry Thornley, like I said, uh, the relationships between him and uh, David Ferry is, is paramount. And they went to great lengths to hide that relationship because you don't really find much indicating uh, that they knew each other or statements that they uh, were roommates. But you have to kind of take the statements that were picked up later in retrospect um, to kind of make those connections. So proving that Kerry Thornley and David Ferry were roommates uh, is comes from anecdotal evidence, but of course it fits a timeline and it becomes obvious when there's gaps of obvious information that those pieces of information were intentionally hidden. So, yeah, 
Yeah, that's uh, that's certainly it. so. I, I guess one question that comes to that, I guess one question that comes up, and the, and the, this is the first time I have. I guess the only reason it's kind of it was more kind of an entertainment kind of angle. I looked at it a year ago, um, but Kerry Thornley thought that he might have been, um, I guess, uh, an MKL, MK Ultra subject. And this author, Adam Go Rightly, um, points to a book by Peter. I guess Peter Peter. Uh, P, I guess uh, uh, Peter Verenda or Venenda. Some some research I've heard of before. I've, I've, I haven't really looked much into his work. Peter Lavenda. Yeah, Peter Lavenda. But basically, that um, the two the two bases overseas in japan i think they were at suge and one other one where they did the i guess lx lsd experimentation were actually the two bases that they were at um so i guess he makes that connection too and if you look at um and, and yeah again i would i would definitely recommend it because um my i i but before i knew about any of this with carrie thorn i'd been reading him from like libertarian publications and he was like 100 percent anti-coercion um like he would like he, so like i don't think he would knowingly like just from reading it and i feel like I have a, i'm a pretty good judge of like being able to read people's authentic, authenticity um and maybe i'm not but anyway that's how that's that's kind of how i how i feel and, and it, it, it it didn't seem like um I mean, it didn't seem like didn't seem like that, but um, at the same time, you you look through his progression and like all those like in that letter he wrote to the the psychi- psychiatry hospital or whatever psychiatric hospital, um, he was going nuts throughout this, and even his closest friends were like, yeah, he was he was going he was he was losing it. Um, so like it's I, I guess it's uh, do you think that's a possibility from anything you anything you've dug up um, that he that from well, that angle? so. Um, I would doubt it, but you know, there's a, there's definitely a certain aspect of of MK Ultra ish stuff in the Kennedy assassination. I mean, David Ferry and uh, Bill DeBar, and like, there's at least two other guys involved in the cast of characters who were like uh, hypnotists. And even David Ferry was using hypnotism on guy on the kids in the Civil Air Patrol uh, to do things, uh, sexual things. And so, yeah, there's an aspect there. Bill DeMar was also using uh, um, hypnosis to blackmail cops with Jack Ruby in the Carousel Club, right? So there's like that aspect to it. But when it comes to people like Kerry Thornley, I am more of the opinion that Kerry Thornley was a completely willing participant in everything. Uh, young kid, excited to join the, the, the military, but he has these, you know, um, idealistic, perhaps, views. Um, all, all the stuff that came out in the Discordianism and all the weird shit later, that might have been like a, something within him that he allowed to was allowed to be developed in the CIA. I mean, they do personality tests on these people when they recruit you, so they knew what kind of person he was and they knew um, what he would be good for, right? Because obviously he gets into being a propagandist. Um, Garrison had found that he had been writing uh, political publications as far back as 6061, Um that didn't really get much attention. And he definitely went off the deep end with the Discordian stuff. But um, i am you'll never convince me otherwise that Robert Anton Wilson and Kerry Thornley had just maintained CIA um, after they after the Kennedy assassination. All, all that bullshit they did was it was just so out there. That was there's no chance that that wasn't intelligence connected. And when you got two guys like Robert Anton Wilson and Kerry Thornley, it's like, duh, it's a big CIA op. You know, and it's it that all kind of connects to um, like the psychedelics and the hippie movement and all that stuff, you know, because like the first time that uh, the Grateful Dead played uh, in one of those big farms up in New York to 10,000 people, the CIA provided the LSD, you know, so like all this stuff has an overlap with, with this weird pop culture stuff and um, maybe a little bit a little bit of it gets out of hand, right? Like the the the, cre- the creation gets away from them, but um, a lot of it, I think the stuff with, particularly with Thornley, that was all like CIA up stuff for sure. Yeah, and yeah, but and the, the connections are pretty undeniable. Um, they really are, and that's why it's that's why it's kind of hard for me to, I guess, to reckon with it all because even this author who is friends with and trying to like vindicate Thornley, um, Adam Go Rightly, he has a chap a chapter in this book was a Discordian front or Discordian Society a CIA front, and there are some interesting connections there too. So like, it's it's really hard to it's really hard to escape it, and I guess my my my. Um, my like initial inclination was just he's dumb and naive, but like maybe that's like maybe that's just like maybe that's like a major major you know uh, benefit. Like if if you can just play I mean, play dumb and act dumb, you got to think like um, they have someone like Kerry Thornley who goes out and does the Discordian stuff, and and what does it do? It attracts a whole bunch of weirdos, and so what they can do from that is they, they can use that as a recruiting pool, right? Maybe use them as some uh, experimentation uh, with LSD and stuff like that. Um, you know, outside the confines of like an MK Ultra laboratory with people getting strapped down and stuff, right? So they create these little subculture groups and experiment within them. Um, you know, I would I would think that 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 would connect to like something like Charles Manson and, and uh, all, all the activities that he was doing out there because he was definitely MK Ultra. 
So, you know, there's a fine line between MK Ultra and um, just CIA doing what the CIA <laughs> does, you know? Right. Yeah. 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 That's that's uh, that's definitely a good point. That's uh, definitely a good point. So um, now, obviously, I will we'll get back get back into Carrie, but I, I want to go ahead and kind of pick up the pick up the thread here with, uh, um, I suppose, with uh, um, with, I guess, the JFK and kind of that back. I uh, yeah, kind of the. Uh, yeah, I guess I suppose we, I, I kind of wanted to to because I, I appreciated this. And again, I want to point people in the direction of your seminar documentary. Cause we're not going to get through all the necessary information today. But um, you talk a little bit about like, uh, I guess, the, the nature of the CIA and the OSS back then and how all of this could have actually gone down with, you know, having multiple patsies, multiple Oswalds, um, you know, sending someone over to Russia, you know, as a as a, you know, as an infiltrator. Could you kind of give us an idea of like the political climate? And what um, I guess the, the CIA and previously the OSS were kind of up to at that time, I guess we could kind of get into that. Yeah, well, the, the OSS, is their main role was psychological warfare, um, and they pretty much developed all of the tactics that they still use to this very day. And see, the mind, um, you know, psychologists have, deter have really kind of, they understand how the mind works in as far as how it absorbs information. So the CIA or prior to the OSS um, took psychologists who knew how people absorbed information, and based on that, they designed systems of propaganda uh, that really uh, work. You know, um, and though uh, they have a playbook, uh, I mean, there's a document called the doctrine regarding rumors. Uh, it's one of my favorite documents of the old OSS stash back from World War II. And uh, it goes into how to construct a rumor and like what are the best, what are the things to include in a rumor and, and give some examples of rumor design. And uh, so they are masters at this stuff. They've had over 100, they've had about 100 years of practice or 80 years of practice at this point in 2022. Um, but the Central Intelligence Agency, um, initially it was just an intelligence agency and they were in charge of propaganda and all that stuff but really it become it became way more militant today it's it's far more uh militarized in the modern era than it was back then um like back then they weren't calling it the cia couldn't call in drone strikes in 1963 right but they can do that today when it really should be a military function um they didn't really have that option but yeah so uh the the CIA, like their job is to lie to you. Like that's the whole fucking point of psychological warfare. And that's their number one priority. And so that's where the media comes in and, and, you know, shaping the narrative and all that stuff. So. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll mention, so I mentioned the JFK dot your JFK documentary a number of times, but there's also one on psychological warfare. That's uh that's really, really, uh, really great. So I'll, I'll point the listeners in the direction of that, but yeah, let's go ahead and pick up with, um, you know, we've got, we got Oswald and, and Thorn or Oswald and Thornley and the Marines. Mm -hmm. Um, Oswald, or I guess Thornley writes, starts writing this book, you know, uh, uh, starts writing this book, the idol warriors before, you know, the assassination happened with the political defection and all that. Um, and, uh, so, dumb. And so yeah, so, me. so pick, pick us up wherever, wherever you think we should start with here. And, and I guess uh, let's, let's, get into it so the, the here's the, the big thing about oswald and thornley they were definitely friends of the marines they definitely knew each other in the 18 months that oswald was back from the soviet union although carrie thornley denies it thornley's girlfriend at the time i can't recall her name offhand um she had seen them together multiple times um a neighbor of oswald's had seen thornley at their place so often that she wasn't sure which one marina was married to that's how often that Thornley was over at Oswald's place. So um, the relationship was there. It was solid. And it was, I guarantee you, it was a setup from day one uh, on the behalf of, um, on the part of Thornley. Because, I mean, we, if we go into like the Fair Play for Cuba committee stuff, you know, that's a CIA front founded by two CIA shills, Robert Tabor, Richard Gibson. And so... Um, that being the case, knowing that uh, Oswald is uh, associated allegedly with the Fair Play for Cuba Committee and it being a, a, a CIA front, um, it was definitely not a real communist organization. It was more COINTELPRO trying to determine who the communists were in the country, who, who people who would volunteer to be part of that organization, and then they would have a list of the communists who got involved. Involved, right so but at the same time they went out recruiting so it was you know kind of like how the FBI sets people up today same kind of thing. So. Um, but the flyers that were printed were not printed by Oswald. The flyers for Fair Play for Cuba Committee that had the 544 Camp Street address were not printed by Oswald. They were printed by Kerry Thornley. Uh, uh, Harold Weisberg went to Jones Printing and he met with uh, Douglas Jones, the owner of Jones Printing, and he showed him over 100 photographs. And Jones picked out four pictures of the man who commissioned those flyers, and all four pictures were of Kerry Thornley. So, um, and being that those flyers that he had printed are the ones that had the 544 Camp Street address that Guy Bannister and Sergio Arcacha and David Ferry all had offices at, 
Um, that led me to believe that fucking Oswald probably didn't even have any contact with those guys at 544 Camp Street and that Kerry Thornley was most likely the person who had printed, the, well, he definitely printed the flyers, definitely stamped the 544 Camp Street on there, and that was blamed on Oswald, and that was the only thing linking Oswald to that building. And I think that that, is, um, that was a screw-up and I think it indicates that Oswald really probably was not associated with those people and that Carrie Thornley was associated with those people and, and misidentified, not necessarily impersonating in some instances, but often misidentified. Because remember, this is in hindsight. Um, so a year before the assassination, someone's in that building and they see Carrie Thornley there. Um, when Oswald's arrested and they see a grainy black and white television showing a guy five foot nine hundred and fifty pounds, general same description, um, they're going to say, "Hey, I think that might have been the guy, right?" So that's how they would count on that because they didn't have cameras on every corner like they do today. Nobody had a cell phone back then, um, and it was much easier to get away with pulling this this body double switcheroo stuff. I think linking Oswald to five forty four Camp Street was a screw up by Kerry Thornley. Um, and Kerry Thornley was actually the one working out of that office, not Oswald. I believe that Oswald just was d doing what he was told, and Kerry Thornley was one of his handlers along with Clay Shaw in New Orleans. So that would indicate that uh, Kerry Thornley is higher up the totem pole than Oswald, right? Yeah, and I guess if, uh, and if, then I, obviously if I from there. If, if I could just just one other thing, just you're talking about how high, how high up how high up is on the totem pole. Um, well, it, to, 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 I guess to confirm another connection in this book from, I guess, from Kerry himself, not necessarily in this case, but he, he mentions it in letters, but this is just the, the author speaking. Um, but, quote, Thornley's brother-in-law revelations soon opened up a floodgate of associated memories as he began to suspect that he'd been set up as, as a substitute patsy in the JFK assassination and that Gary Kirstein, a.k.a. E. e. Howard Hunt, or whatever the actu whatever, whoever he actually was, had been one of his intelligence agency handlers. Once Kerry opened the store to his mm -hmm. past, a torrent of recovered memories continued to dilute him, um, et cetera, et cetera. During this period, Kirsten commissioned Kerry to conduct research for a book he was planning to write entitled Hitler Was a Good Guy. While researching the project at the <laughs> New Orleans Public Library, Kerry had written Hitler Was a Good Guy on the top of each page, along with his own name, and then turned the notes over to Kirsten. Um, later, Kerry suspected that uh, trying to you know, incriminate him in the JFK assassination. But anyway, that was apparently yeah, e so, e. e. Howard Hunt. But yeah. Well, th possibly maybe not maybe. um so th that might be the whole story might be just made up because that that story is the story that came from carrie thornley um to jim garrison uh jim garrison's the one who extracted all that information from him okay so <laughs> when you go through that file it's about 100 and, i think it's about 150 pages long there's two or three files there's maybe a total of three to four hundred pages on thornley and garrison's files and when you go through them you really come to find that, that guy never told the same story twice um, okay. the story he tells about brother-in-law and Gary Kirsten are questionable at best. Um, and he, he still is, he still is admitting that he's in contact with CIA, right? So like the guy, he just doesn't know how to tell a fucking lie. Um, it's, uh, it, yeah, it's a big mishmash. We can't believe anything that he says. That's you fair. need corroboration. You need corroboration on things. Um, and for me, like connecting, uh, Carrie Thornley to the tippet shooting, like, how did that come about? Well, that came about because I came to understand that there were two men, not a hundred, impersonating Oswald, and that the person uh, who was had been impersonating Oswald while Oswald was a child is out of the picture at this point, right? We don't know anything about him post-1959. Although John Armstrong is right on the... He, he gathered some great data. The conclusions he drew were total dog shit. Um, he made all the wrong conclusions on who was impersonating Oswald where, and he tried to apply, apply like, that other duplicate Oswald is from when Oswald was a child who was with him from like 47 all the way up to 63, allegedly. Um, he attributed all the duplicate Oswald sightings to that person, and it was just false. And when you come to understand, again, relationships and half the Oswald sightings, Oswald was seen with a husky Latino with a pockmarked face or had bumps on his face. Obviously, William Seymour and Lawrence Howard. Then when you came across the Oswald with the you know the bearded beatnik and the, and the whiskers and all that, obviously, Carrie Thornley. That's when I realized, and I went through hundreds of uh, sightings of Oswald, and I kind of determined that 90% of them or more, other than like one at the Texas Employment Commission was Larry Crawford, but 90 plus percent of the of the everything that we know about Oswald, I determined was either Kerry Thornley or William Seymour in, in different circumstances, everywhere from New Orleans uh, to Alabama to Florida to Dallas to Houston to Alice, Texas to the Mexican border. Okay, so... Um, 
Yeah, so then I realized that, uh, then I tracked the, uh, knowing that William Seymour and Kerry Thornley are the two men impersonating Oswald, and I tracked Kerry Thornley's, uh, or, really, or I'm sorry, William Seymour's movements, uh, and I'm not going to get too much into him. Uh, William Seymour was at the depository, and then he goes into Oak Cliff, but he was uh, he was 10 to 20 blocks away from the tippet shooting at the time, and that left only one other duplicate Oswald in Dallas who had been impersonating Oswald, and that was Kerry Thornley. Uh, and then when you come to understand that the second person involved in the shooting is described by Akila Clemens and Frank Wright uh, uh, is, uh, you know, a kind of a chunky guy who's not really uh, not really big, but he's a uh, kind of heavy guy uh, uh, with the heavy eyebrows as seen by Velma behind the knoll. And you can start to connect the dots between uh, Kerry Thornley being the, du the duplicate Oswald who was involved in the tippet shooting and the other man there who was David Ferry. And then, holy shit, they were buddies in New Orleans from 60 to 63 not coincidence right this is part of the plot the the plotters were david ferry and how it circulated around david ferry uh and it was kind of funny because for years i thought it was just going to be mostly on the mafia with like giancana and all these guys um and then when it really clicked for me that david ferry was the central person in new orleans i realized how close garrison actually came to getting it right the first time you know but mm. it's the study of relationships and uh like if I, i'm going to give you an example right so like, and I give this, I've given this before. Like we're on Sesame street. Right. And like Bert and Ernie's house gets broken into and the witness says, I don't know who did it, but it was a seven foot tall yellow bird. Okay. Like who broke into Bert and Ernie's house? It was fucking big bird. And how do we know this? Because we know the relationships and the cast of characters. We know who it was because of the limited set of characteristics that we would have within a group. That's how I identified all the shooters. Every last one. Because you come to, you look at the descriptions from multiple people in Dealey Plaza, you cross-reference that with your cast of characters, and you're like, what do you know? That matches this guy. And holy shit, his partner happens to match his best friend. What do you know? It's those guys, right? So it's not really rocket science, but these fucking JFK research douchebags out there who make millions of dollars writing books and haven't solved a goddamn thing, um, these people seemingly can't uh, think on that you know, fundamental of a level. They're constantly twisting things and looking for reasons to discredit information. And that to me, that just goes back to COINTELPRO and infiltration of these communities by the intelligence agencies. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you mentioned, so, so yeah, everything else like before, like, oh, you know, maybe you could have just been duped or, you know, whatever the Tippets thing is like, no, like that's, that's, that's a little step, step beyond. Um, that was kind of my, my perception initially now for more conversation here. And I'll, I'll even add one other, one other, um, one other um, point here to the, I guess, the intelligence agency part, or I guess the, the intelligence part, but, um, quote, the FBI had monitored Kerry's activities during the mid-60s when he was editing the Innovator Libertarian publication the Bureau may have considered subversive. So the, the even the publications he went to edit for, it sounds like they were under surveillance for um, for years. So um, kind of the what, what you're saying here is kind of like pulling, pulling, pulling weirdos in the Discordian society and then having, you know, the, that sort of thing. I'd never heard of that that kind of angle before, and it makes more sense than what I was thinking before. Like, yo, I, I, I don't know. Anyway, um, but uh, yeah, I, 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 I guess um, uh, we do need to talk more about, the, I guess, the Tippets thing because, uh, but, but I guess maybe, do you want to, I guess, do you want to kind of walk through, I guess, um, I guess uh, some of the overview of the, of, of, you know, that, that day on November 22nd, 1963, um, and then kind of we can, um, um, we can tie in the Tippet thing to that a little bit. Sure. Uh, well, the thing that connects to Tippet was David Ferry because David Ferry, and this took me like, this was like three years into my research before it just dawned on me. Like I kept. It, it didn't even dawn on me that David Ferry might have actually been in Dallas for like at least a year or two into my research, which was obviously should have been one of the first things I was I considered. But um, <coughs> once I put David Ferry in Dallas, which was which was somewhat in, in hindsight, it looks easy. But the process was grueling, man. Like <laughs> I put in 12 days for fucking years, like straight, like it was obsession. Like I couldn't there were nights I fucking fell asleep on my laptop and I like woke up and just went right back to work you know like didn't even get up for breakfast or nothing just like just hit it straight because mm -hmm. that was a, an obsession right so but once i realized david ferry was in dallas and that the whole incident at the winterland ice arena which was really only done to establish an alibi for him right because david ferry allegedly was in new orleans on november 22nd he's seen at noon uh he's seen again at six o'clock at a dinner for carlos marcello he allegedly leaves new orleans nine o'clock at night uh, with two uh, young boys, about 18 and 19 years old, Alvin Bobuf and Leighton Martins, who was using the alias of Melvin Coffee, and they supposedly drive to Houston to go ice skating, right? 
Well, the ice skating story ends up being the most important fucking aspect of the entire assassination in as far as the proof. Um, because it turns out the ice skating rink was owned by Lyndon Johnson, whose uh, right-hand man was Jack Valenti, who was the shooter on the grassy knoll. Uh, it was also, um, uh, the owner uh, was Lyndon Johnson, who leased it to him, a woman named Mary Boots Roberts, who was the cousin of a man named Vincent Caltagarone Jr., who was Jack Valenti's brother-in-law, right? So you have this like network of people of all connected to the military and intelligence and the president um, at this ice skating rink. And I'm like, well, what are the odds that David Ferry just wanted to go ice skating at this ice skating rink that happened to be owned by Lyndon Johnson and, and run by the CIA as a CIA front to traffic children, which is exactly what the fuck they were doing there. Um, so yeah, not coincidence. And so when I really pulled apart the story of the Winterland, that connected me to you know Vincent Caltagirone, who was the short tramp also. And the short tramp is the real Raul who set up Martin Luther uh, or James Orway and the Martin Luther King assassination, right? So you have this like incredibly important, globally historical, uh, a global historical importance, you know, centered around the Winterland ice rink. And I realized that David Ferry never even went to the fucking ice rink. It was all alibi stuff because he was in Dallas. And then the night of the assassination. After uh, he shot Kennedy from the knoll, but he was not the grassy knoll shooter. Jack Valenti was. So um, David Ferry does the, f the first shot and it hits Kennedy in the throat, right? He then throws the rifle to a guy named Andrew Jerome Blackman, who's wearing like a railroad uniform, breaks it down um, and uh, walks away casually. He's then seen by a man named Ed Hoffman, who, who witnessed him shooting the rifle and throwing it to the other man. Uh, he then cuts into the pergola where he's photographed, walks through the railroad tracks where he's photographed, and then he gets into a gray Plymouth behind the book depository where it was parked. Uh, there it is. Uh, he is seen by a woman named Velma who gives a very good description of him with the real heavy eyebrows, wearing a suit, uh, black hair. And uh, and he ends up uh, leaving there and going to the Tippett shooting, right? Because, you know, Tippett is in on this thing. Uh, Velma, the witness behind the book depository who saw David Ferry, she says that a cop gets out of a cop car and tells David Ferry, hey, I told you to move that car. And she identifies that cop as J.D. Tippett, which I believe her, uh, because Tippett was photographed on Houston Street um, at the time that the Ken at Kennedy's uh, motorcade was passing uh, uh, onto Elm Street. So uh, basically, uh, David Ferry fires the first shot, and then he uh, flees in a car, Gray Plymouth. He makes his way over to the shooting of J.D. Tippett, where uh, he meets up with Carrie Thornley, who's driven to that uh, crime scene uh, by two cops, Westbrook and Croy, work for Dallas Police Department. Uh, they pick him up at the boarding house, okay? And say, so if you can see, you have these series of dots that all end up connecting, right? So you have these two cops who go to the boarding house and they honk the horn. And for 60 fucking years, researchers are like, oh, I wonder why they honk the horn, duh, right? Uh, duh, they picked him up and they drove him to the shooting, right? That's why they were there. Um, and see, so that connects Kerry Thornley to the boarding house. And it's like, well, Kerry Thornley was the boarding house, not Oswald. So Oswald didn't live there. And then you're like, well, hey, he probably didn't live at the other boarding house, did he? And then you research that and sure as shit, both boarding houses have a connection to Jack Ruby. So yeah, um, Oswald didn't leave. It, and that was at the point where I'm like, well, Oswald probably wasn't anywhere. And I was correct. Oswald wasn't anywhere. When you dig into Oswald, Oswald is nowhere to be found. Um, I can't pinpoint any of Oswald's actual activities after he comes back from the Soviet Union until he shows up at the Texas theater um, when he gets arrested. So he was impersonated all over the place ad nauseum, right? Extensively, um, even up to and including, I believe, the book depository. I don't believe Oswald worked at the book depository. I do not believe for a split second he was there at the book depository that day. Um, if you're going to have a patsy and you're going to set him up for killing the president. Um, why are you going to let him wander around the building at will while you're funneling assassins into the building at about 12, 10 p.m.? So for 20 minutes, you got assassins on the sixth floor, and you're just going to let Oswald just wander around the building, right? Give me a break. Oswald wasn't there that day. And so how do you give the impression that Oswald was there that day if Oswald never worked there? Because you have somebody else working there under the name Lee Harvey Oswald, which is exactly what I think happened. Uh, I have evidence that um, William Seymour, who had been impersonating Oswald all over the place, the gun range and... Uh, all, at the Carousel Club and all over the place. I believe it was him. I have evidence that he was there that day on November 22nd at the book depository. I have an image of him out back at the depository is captured in the Robert Hughes film and he's wearing a light brown jacket. Oswald never owned a light brown jacket. The jacket that was found at the scene was never owned by Oswald. He had two jackets, a gray jacket and a blue jacket. He never owned the jacket that was allegedly captured or picked up by police at the Tippett shooting. So we have uh, 
William Seymour inside the book depository. Um, we have the incident of uh, Oswald being stopped on the second floor where he's drinking a Coke 90 seconds after the assassination, right? That story, that never happened. That's pure myth that was made up mm. after the fact to cover for the fact that Baker um, actually arrested somebody prior to entering the building. I believe that he arrested the shooter who shot from the Deltex building. The shooter at the Deltex building fired not from a window, but from the fire escape from the ledge underneath the fire escape. And I believe that man was Emilio Santana. And I believe that he was arrested shortly after he fired the shots that hit Kennedy in the back uh, and that uh, struck James Tagg and cracked the windshield and all that good stuff. So um, that being the case, uh, using the statements of uh, Robert McNeil, reporter who was inside the book depository until 12.37 p.m., uh, Robert McNeil states that no police entered the building while he was there. And he had been there from about 12.32 to 12.38 uh, he had a phone call, timestamp 1236, and he says no cops were in the building. So that means the incident with Baker and Truly, where they allegedly bump into Oswald on the second floor with the Coke story, that couldn't have happened until at least 1237 after McNeil left the building. And on top of that, we know it wasn't in the second floor, second floor lunchroom because it was on the stairs. We have Baker's initial notes, and we have two reports from Dallas police saying that Baker stopped this man between the fourth and third floor, describes him as wearing a br light brown jacket, okay? It is not Oswald because I don't have any evidence Oswald works in this building, period. All the evidence we have are things like time cards, which had to show a perfect attendance record by Oswald. I have a dozen sightings of him around the country while he should be at work. So I have no, at this point, I don't have a single shred of evidence Oswald ever stepped foot in that building. I believe it was just another front job like all his other jobs, right? So how do you give the impression that Lee Harvey Oswald shot the president from inside the Texas Bowl but depository if he doesn't even work there? You have somebody impersonating them there. And when you go through the statements of the people who worked in the book depository, half the freaking employees of the building never saw Oswald until they saw him on television. So, yeah. Hmm. Um, and the people who did know Oswald as Oswald inside the building were people who were introduced to Seymour as Oswald. And so let me ask you a question. If you're working at a building and uh, the president is allegedly shot from that building and you're told Oswald did it and you go and you look on TV and the, the guy they're telling you is Oswald is not the Oswald that you know, are you going to open your mouth about it? Nope. You're not going to say a damn thing. You're going to be scared to death and you're going to wonder what's going on. And you're and you're, you're going to hide the fact that, you know, the person that is on TV as Oswald is not the person you worked with. And I believe that is exactly what happened at the book depository. It was a big setup. Um, and the setup of Oswald started years before, started in like late 59, early 60, and probably not as a plot to kill a president, but as a plot to get a spy into Cuba, right? After he comes back from the Soviet Union, hey, let's get him this guy into Cuba. But that didn't end up happening. Then when the plot started, they had plenty of time. And we know that the plot was in the works as early back as February or March of 63, because we have the receipts of like the handgun and the rifle, which they ordered to the P.O. box, which Oswald never owned that stuff. But we have the dates showing when they were ordered. Um, and that was like, way, 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 way early in 63, meaning that they knew the setup was the setup for to kill the president was definitely going on since probably if I had to take a guess, January, February of 63 is when it was probably decided. So, yeah. So I guess uh, just a, a couple of things I'd like to go into more because it, it, it lends even more credence. And, and I think there's an interesting background to that, too. But the school book, uh, the Texas School Book Depository from your research, again, is a kind of a CIA front. Right. Um, and they print all the school textbooks. I'd, yeah. I'd like you to talk about talk about that a little bit. And then the other thing with um, the other thing with uh, with Thornley in regards to patsies. It's like what, what this is. That's one conclusion I've had a hard time coming to is that um, what do they do to the patsies? Will they kill them? And what do they do to, you know, associates? Will they keep them alive? And Thornley was arrested. I mean, from if I recall, Thornley was arrested twice and let go, right? Um, from the theater and also, and, and also after, after, maybe after the after the Tippett shooting. But he was arrested and let go. Um, so that's like that's you know, disconcerting because yeah, they kill patsies, right? Yeah, but Thornley was definitely higher up. He yeah, was not exactly. a, definitely not a patsy, exactly. and he had been overseeing Oswald for three years at that point. So. Yeah. Um, and then and it's funny because that book mentions the Johnny Roselli thing. Like, it's so funny because because uh, uh, Carrie Thornley, I guess, like moves to California or something like that. Um, and he allegedly gets a job doorman in a building. Just so happens that Johnny Roselli lives there. Give me a fucking break. Um, I want to know who the real, real real estate developer on that building was. Right. Definitely a mob guy because the mob and the CIA worked together at least in the 60s and 70s. They were bosom buddies. Um, inseparable. So, yeah. Um, and it's funny because Carrie Thornley, like, you should read the, the Carrie Thornley files in the garrison uh, files. They're really they're really good. 
I need to. Yeah. You'll see what I'm talking about. He's so, all, he's so all over the place. Like there's just no hope, no coherence to his uh, statements and how he changed his story over the years. Like I saw him on like current affair or something like that before he died. And he's like, I was involved in the plot to kill the president, but Oswald beat me to it. <laughs> it's like, shut the fuck up. Shut up. Just <laughs> stop talking. Like, <laughs> yeah but see here's the thing if you're a young guy picture being a guy 17 you join the marines by 18 you're in the fucking cia or naval intelligence or just heavy duty intelligence by by 21 22 you're killing people and be involved in the plot to kill a president and then you go off on this fucking drug lsd tangent and, and discordianism and you're going to tell me that person's not going to have mental issues give me a fucking <laughs> break like i have no it's no wonder that his mind fell apart um you know, like, I just wish we'd have gotten a truthful deathbed confession from the guy. Yeah. You know? Yeah, no, it's... it's None of these yeah. guys give truthful deathbed confessions, except E. Howard Hunt. He, and E. Howard Hunt was wrong. When E. Howard Hunt gave his deathbed confession, he was wrong. And I believed him. And you know what? It's because he didn't know. He genuinely didn't know. He was not, he was not in that inner circle. Wow. He oversaw the Cuban operations going on in New Orleans, yes. And he was definitely connected to, like, uh, David Ferry and, and William Seymour and all those guys. But the level of compartmentalization was so much that he didn't even know. He thought the Corsicans were actually the shooters. And there were Corsican shooters there. Well, they brought in Corsican assassins. They flew them in through Montreal, down through New York, and they came in through Dallas. And I'm pretty sure they were in Dealey Plaza, but they were just standing around. They had so many fucking shady people in Dealey Plaza. So when the FBI or whoever goes to look and see, hey, well, how many potentially shady people were in Dealey Plaza? They're going to find all of them, right? And what do you do with that? You fucking walk away from it is what you do, which is exactly what happened. Because I promise you, you you had at least dozens, you had dozens of assassins walking around Dealey Plaza. Otto Scorzani was in Dealey Plaza and he was a personal assassin for goddamn Hitler. So, hmm. you know. The worst of the worst were there witnessing this thing. They had to. It was almost like an occult initiation for Jack Valente, which involved uh, they needed to be all, all be there. Kind of like some weird eyes wide shut shit. Like, really strange. Like, these occultist fucks, man. Like, it blew my mind because I'm, I'm, I'm very well versed in consciousness, but I'm an atheist. Uh, I, I've done a lot of psychedelics, and so I've always been a very there's no God kind of person. Um, and so I never understood how smart people could be into weird occult shit and actually believe it. I'm like, they're too smart. There's no way. And it, it really, it took getting through most of my Kennedy research to like, before it fucking hit me like a ton of bricks that, oh my God, this stuff is really real. And these people are not that smart and they do believe in this occult shit. And it was like, uh, it was a major, um, it was a paradigm shift for me. Yeah. It was, it was hard to swallow. So I guess the, the other, yeah, it definitely isn't. So that's the other, the other interesting thing is that, so like my, 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 I guess, initial look into the JFK station was through the eyes of Bill Cooper. And, um, he apparently from, from what I heard had a, a bad, had a bad tape. Um, but he, but he, he, he had a, a, a documentary put out in the, in the mid nineties called uh, JFK, the sacrifice King. And he talked about it being a killing of the King ritual, as you pointed out in your, um, he didn't have the pictures. He went at it from a very different angle, but that was a conclusion that he came to too, was that it was a, a killing of the King. Ritual, um, and that was that was um, a mind, I, that was a mind blowing part from from yours. I had not seen those pictures, but my God, um, I guess uh, yeah. I, if you want to if you want to talk about that at all, that I mean I mean I, it's it is like it's wild, but I mean we're yeah we're here and it's it's important wild, to talk about right yeah it's wild wild like fucking wild like you if, when it's so funny because like when you're studying Kennedy and you're looking for the like the idea on the, sh the grassy knoll shooter right. And everyone has in mind that it's this, oh, my God, stellar person, like, holy shit, super assassin, you know, must be like QJ Wynn or one of these guys who's legendary. Uh, and it turned out definitely to be. But I got to a point where I was like, I'm putting too much emphasis on the mystery being the important part. And I have no reason to believe that he was anything other than one of a dozen mob guys who was nobody special. Um, I'm glad I was wrong about that. But that was a possibility, right? So we like to put like heavy emphasis on things that we don't really understand uh, and hope that it's like comes out to be the, the, you know, Christmas morning when we come up with the fucking answer. Um, but when I discovered the ritualistic stuff in Dealey Plaza, that was like, that was better than like any punchline I could have possibly imagined. 
it was the most shocking fucking thing in, in the universe. Like I can't imagine anything more holy shit devastating, especially if it could become widely known to people what actually happened, how devastating that would be to those to that group of people. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, but the truth needs to come out uh, at all costs. So, yeah. Yeah, so I guess just out of, out of curiosity, because uh, I know I know you've been asked about the about apparently again apparently the fake the fake tape that that uh, Bill Cooper is working from. Like I guess Greer the driver was the the shooter, which apparently is not not the case. No. Um, but uh, um, I mean, it just you... doesn't it just doesn't make sense. I mean, I understand like the, the way it really went down was crazier than the driver shooting it, but they need plausible deniability, you know. And so <clears throat> I'm still trying to work out how the fuck Greer picked up Valenti. Um, from under the over, from under the overpass, I have the photographic evidence that he did. I just can't. We don't know enough about what happened because uh, you know people say the, the the limousine stopped. Some people say it slowed down. I'm starting to be of the belief that that fucking car was barely moving when Kennedy was shot, and that they didn't speed off, and that they took their time, and they probably gave uh, they probably gave Jack Valenti, who was the shooter on the knoll, they probably gave him a good ten to fifteen seconds of mm -hmm. stall time for him to, to slide down to the other side of the knoll and then hop into the limousine. And uh, so it's interesting because I just found, um, I heard about this a long time ago, but I'm writing my book and I'm at the part, I'm actually writing through this part of the book right now. And so I was looking for evidence of anyone who saw a man with a rifle slide down the other side of the knoll. And I find it. So um, a cop who was off duty, and this is shady. This is totally shady. And I have a feeling the story that I'm about to tell is um, is half true and half false. And probably he was told to shut the fuck up by the Dallas Police Department after the initial story broke. And it's kind of been twisted. So Tom Tilson is the guy's name. Dallas cop. He's driving um, in the direction of the motorcade uh, on the other side of Daly Plaza, right? The other side of the underpass. And he says... He sees a man with a rifle slide down the steep incline on the other side of the grassy knoll. However, and that's exactly what I was looking for. However, this is where his story veers off. He says that this person slides down with the rifle, but then gets into a black car that was parked there and drives away. However, we know that there could not have been a black car there because we have a we have the McIntyre photo. Uh, which shows the field in its entirety, and there's no black car there. So there's no black car for anyone with a rifle to slide down and get into. So that part of his story is bunk. But is the first part of his story true, that he saw somebody with the rifle slide down the knoll? Because I came to that conclusion based on the evidence at hand, and then I find his statement saying that he saw somebody slide down the knoll, and then we know there couldn't have been a car there. So, you know, what do I make of that? It substantiates what I believe happened with Valenti on the knoll coming down the other side. But the obfuscation comes from the fact that he works for the police department and they probably were like, shut the fuck up about this. You didn't see that. You know, and so he had to change the story. He probably went to him and said, man, I saw a guy with a rifle slide down the knoll and hop in the president's car. And then they're like, what? You like your pension? You know, um, so that's probably what happened. He was probably forced to change his story. And the story we got was the modified story after the fact. But I'm going to put it in my book as a neutral reference, not as evidentiary. But, hey, I'm going to put it in there as, hey, this is what he saw. So who knows? Yeah. Yeah. So I guess um, I will if, if we could just for, for the sake of the audience, for, for the sake of the audience um, and maybe maybe for a good minute or two clip at the beginning. Um, but uh, um, I guess uh, um, for the for, I guess you've listed like seven or eight shooters that were there that were there that day that, you know, fired, I guess, maybe fired shots or whatever. Could you just, I guess, lay that out for people right. where they were um, so that I guess that's probably what, what sure. people are really interested in, first and foremost? Sure. <clears throat> so the shooters up in the book depository, um, we have. Lawrence Howard, who was the dark skinned, complected, uh, dark complected Mexican with a pockmarked face, he's in the sniper's nest. Across from him is Lauren Hall. Lauren Hall, William Seymour, and Lawrence Howard are a trio who traveled together. Everything they did, they did together. When you start to link Oswald sightings with the Mexican with a pockmarked face, which happened all over New Orleans and Dallas, believe it or not, um, you come to realize it's these guys. And so then when you when I identified the shooter up in the sniper's nest, who was repeatedly described as a, 
um, heavy set Latino with a dark complexion. One witness even said he had something wrong with his face as though his face was wrinkled, obviously referring to the pock marks on his face. And the, he had multiple moles on both cheeks, really ugly guy. Um, so obviously if we've got Lawrence Howard in the sniper's nest and we have a shooter matching the same description, but basically a white guy on the other side is obviously Lauren Hall because why relationships are everything. And where's William Seymour? He's down on the first floor guarding the elevators. Okay. Um, William Seymour is captured on film in the Robert Hughes film. Uh, then he's stopped by Baker and truly. Um, so I'm going to skip over all the rest of the stuff with him. Um, when you get to like the pergola area, you have that little like concrete little, they call it the pergola. It's that, that concrete, like, uh, you know, overhang thing they have there. Um, we have a couple people. We have uh, Dave Yaris, who was a longtime Chicago mob guy who I traced from Miami to, to Dallas and then to Chicago. And he had a partner named Lenny Patrick, who was probably his spotter here with him. But, uh, you know, there's evidence of a shot fired from between the pergola and the fence. I believe that was fired by Dave Yaris. And then I believe that a man in a white shirt with gray hair, Captured on film behind the uh, behind the, in the railroad tracks in the minutes after the assassination, I believe is Dave Yaris. Um, uh, I also believe that Danny Green was a shooter. Danny Green, uh, also known as the Irishman, was an Irish mobster out of uh, Cleveland who at the time was working with the Cleveland mob. Uh, shortly after the assassination, he had a meteoric rise to power in the mob as the head of the Longshoresman Union. Uh, which is a big deal, big deal position in Cleveland because they controlled the docks and that docks is where all the smuggling goes on, right? So for Danny Green to take that over, that was a reward. That was a reward for him uh, and his participation in the Kennedy assassination. Um, and why do I think he was participant? Well, he was a sniper trainer in the Marines before going to work for the mob. He worked for the Genovese family in New York mm. in the railroads before moving to Cleveland and working for James Nicavoli and Leo Mosseri. And then uh, these guys, I know they were there because they're the tramps. Leo Mosseri, um, Danny Green and a guy named Vincent Caltagirone Jr., uh, who we discussed earlier, is connected to the Winterland, who's the real Raul. He's the short tramper. So those are the three tramps. That's how I put Danny Green behind the pergola, because you're not going to bring a sniper trainer from the Marines to an assassination and not put a rifle in his hand. Common sense, right? So we don't have any other evidence other than the circumstances, but the circumstantial evidence that Danny Green was a shooter is very high. Um. Then we have uh, David Ferry. David Ferry is a grassy knoll shooter number one. Jack Valente is a grassy knoll shooter number two. So the first shot fired by David Ferry, uh, I explained this a little bit earlier, fires a shot, hits Kennedy in the throat, throws it to Blackman, and casually walks off before being photographed and then seen by Velma and then going to the tippet shooting. Um, Jack Valenti. So this is, where I'm, this is where I'm at in the book. I'm writing this up right now as we speak, and I've spent the last about week going over the individual statements of the Secret Service car and dissecting every second and every photograph and everything going on in the couple seconds between when Kennedy is hit and when the Secret Service car makes its way past the triple underpass. And I can tell you with absolute certainty that Jack Valenti shot President Kennedy from the grassy knoll and came down the other side. He's then picked up by Greer in the limousine. Why? I don't know. He could have gone right to the Secret Service car and I never would have figured out shit. But we have the McIntyre photo, which shows a man in the back of the president's limo holding a fucking rifle, which to me, this rings of the weird occult stuff um, flaunting in, in their like face over that the body he shot kind of, Kennedy. Yeah. Right, right. Some weird fuck you kind of thing, right? So I can't really explain it other yeah, and for, than and for, some for kind the, of right of for, for the video viewers, it's behind It's behind you um, on your background. You can see the – I mean, yeah, you can, you can see it. It's – uh, yeah, it's – you can see the couple, yeah, yeah couple that's of it. gunmen right. with the in the car. I'd, so yeah, I'd never seen that strange. angle before like, too. But yeah, that's wild. Oh, when I saw it, I, I about fell out my chair um, because the whole thing with Valenti fell into place. Once I realized that Valenti was not arrested on the knoll, and then he actually got away. Uh, I was like, holy shit! The only way he could have gotten away, and I started looking at the photographs, and then I found the, the McIntyre number two photo. Um, and there he is, uh, Jack Valenti and David Morales standing on a secret service car. So what I did, uh, the day before yesterday, I went and pulled all the statements of the secret service car guys and I caught all the contradictions. And then I pulled the photographic record and I showed that there were 10 men on the secret service car in Daly Plaza. Um, two of them got off, um, Dave Powers, who was an assistant to Kennedy. He gets out of the secret service car. And then you have Clint Hill who gets out of the secret service car and he goes to the limousine. So you're down to eight men. There should only be eight men in the Secret Service car. Yet, um, between Dealey Plaza and just past the underpass, you have 10 men on that car. 10. 
and I, I listed them out on the photograph and I indicated where all 10 were. So it went from 10 men down to eight, which is where it should have stayed. But mysteriously, when they pass through the underpass, they pick up two passengers, Dave Morales and Jack Valenti, who's the grassy knoll shooter. So um, this work has been rejected by the entire JFK research community. I have to let you know, there are such a bunch of dumb fucks. Um, I've presented a lot of this work to them and I've not the stuff about the null shooter, but um, all the other stuff banned from every fucking forum and Facebook group. Cause they just don't want to hear it. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, uh, that's, uh, so, so I guess, um, and again, I'll, 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 I'll point, I'll point the listeners in the direction of it again and, uh, and put a link to it in the show notes. But, um, in the documentary, you spent like an hour on like seven minutes, um, going through, you know, what, tra what, what, yeah. what transpired in the, in the depository and what transpired in the theater. And, um, the theater involves Carrie Thornley. Um, and again, what I appreciate from, from yours is you go through all the, like you, you for, first and foremost focus on the source documentation and coming up with uh, figuring it out from, from all that. Um, so if you, if people watch this documentary, you can walk, you can look at all the evidence and all the pictures and all that, um, as you're going along through it. But, um, uh, yeah, could you give uh, I guess a little, uh, a little, I guess, tell us what happened at the, at the theater and I guess, uh, with Oswald and, and Thornley and, and kind of the, I guess the, the happenings there. Sure. Well, Oswald is seen entering the theater, um, between one o'clock and one o seven. Right. So J.D. Tippett is shot at 106. So what I believe happened is that I don't believe Oswald was in Dealey Plaza at all that day. I believe it was William Seymour working in the book depository as Oswald. And I have more evidence to support that than there is evidence that Oswald ever worked there. Um, so. I'm trying to think of where a good spot to pick up from this is. Um, so we'll take it from like uh, the Tippett shooting, right? So Kerry Thornley is involved in the Tippett shooting along with David Ferry. Uh, Kerry Thornley flees and he flees to a secondhand junk shop on Jefferson Street. And he tries to get in. Like it's like it must be a contact or a hideout or something, but he can't get in there. And so he runs down the steps and he discards his jacket, but he doesn't discard his jacket underneath the car at the Texaco. He discards it on a tire rack behind the Texaco. And somehow the jacket is relocated um, after it's found by a woman whose name was... Um, Dorothea Dean. And so she was at Dean's Dairy Way. She witnessed the whole thing with Carrie Thornley, but this is not part of the official story, right? And it's supposedly Oswald. Everyone says it's Oswald because they looked so close together in 1963. Same height, same weight, skinny, receding hairline, right? And if you see somebody for a split second on, in person, and then you see him for hours on TV, of course, you're going to, you could mix them up very easily. And that's how they got away with a lot of the body double stuff with William Seymour and Carrie Thornley. So the, from there, Carrie Thornley flees to the Abundant Life Temple, which is a Jewish temple, but it's really a front. It's a fraud. It's run by a guy who's opened up other temples around and uh, had no known uh, congregates, right? Nobody ever went to this temple. Um, there's also some, uh, another person who incorporated the temple that he went to was somehow connected to Jack Ruby through uh, trail continental, uh, busways. So there's a lot of weird shenanigans going on with this temple, but he goes and he hides there. And then uh, actually I, I have to correct myself because I adjusted the timeline and I realized that Carrie Thornley had fled from the abundant life temple prior to the cops showing up there. So the person that they had actually detained was at the library, oh. not at the abundant life temple. OK, so not Thornley. And they did have the wrong guy because Thornley was there. But then he he dipped out. Um, he was there for probably about 10, 15 minutes, though. So he must have met with a contact in there somehow. And then on a schedule, on a schedule, totally timed. He left at 12 uh, or at, yeah, 1235. Or I'm sorry. At this point, it's 135. Right. It's an hour later. It's 135. And then he makes his way to the Texas theater. But on the way, he stops in at Johnny Brewer's store, Hardy Shoe Store, where Johnny Brewer is working. But Johnny Brewer has another guy working in the store with him. A guy named. Oh, shit. What's this guy's name? Roe. I can't remember his first name, but his last name is Roe. R-O-W-E. And Roe is an associate of Jack Ruby's, and he was so close to Jack Ruby that he actually moved into Jack Ruby's apartment when Jack Ruby went to jail. Okay, so uh, Tommy Roe, that's his name, Tommy Roe. So Tommy Roe and Jack Ruby are, are in this together, and I believe the whole thing with the shoe store is a staged event, just like everything else. It's a series of staged events to create this fictional story. It's a Truman show. It really is. It's, uh, it's, it's amazing. It's a brilliant work of art, what they pulled off. Um, it's really, when you come to understand like, the level of tradecraft involved in this thing, it's it's, it's beautiful. Um, but so, yeah, so uh, Terry Thornley makes a scene at the shoe store. Then we have the shoe store guy goes over and makes a scene and then the cops show up and all that stuff. But Terry Thornley's hiding out in the in the balcony and uh, Lee Oswald is downstairs. Now, when Lee Oswald gets there, he goes and he sits in front of a guy 
Um, and then he gets up and sits directly next to him. The guy's like, there's only 20 people in this theater. Why, why is this guy sitting next to me? And Oswald gets up two or three times and just sits down next to a person before finally sitting down next to a pregnant woman. And he talks to a pregnant woman for a couple of minutes, and then both of them get up and leave to go to the lobby. <clears throat> this is at 1.15. The woman leaves, and Oswald buys popcorn. So this is 30 minutes before the police storm the building. Oswald goes and buys popcorn and goes back to watch the movie where he's eating his fucking popcorn. He has no idea what is happening. He has no idea that the cops are about to bust in and get him. He just met with his contact, um, who was a pregnant woman. And that week, a pregnant woman had been seen at Ruth Payne's house. But I have not been able to identify her. Um, so, yeah. Um, Oswald meets with the contact. She dips out of there, probably says, just wait here, just stay here, watch the rest of the movie, and then I'll meet up with you later or something, right? So she instructs him to stay there. Cops come in. He gets arrested. After he's arrested, Carrie Thornley is arrested out of the balcony and dragged out the back of the theater. This is witnessed by Butch Burroughs, the manager of the theater, who couldn't believe that within a matter of a couple minutes, he saw two men who looked like they could be brothers. He's like, if it wasn't Oswald, it was his twin, right? So, um, that's how close Carrie Thornley looked to Oswald at the time. And so yeah, he's arrested out the back. That's also seen by a guy named Bernard Hare, who owns uh, Bernard or Hare's Hobby House right next door. He sees him getting arrested out the back door. Yes. Caught in a crossfire. Just for, for the, so people can see kind of the resemblance. But yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah. So um, that's how that went down. And uh, the rest we know is history. So, uh, but all that stuff gets excluded from the official story. And then you get dumb shits like Michael Shermer, who was actually on Joe Rogan today. Uh, I started watching that before I was, before this interview and they were, he was explaining why Kennedy was not a conspiracy. And I'm like, you're the dumbest person that's ever walked the earth. It's unfucking believable, but, um, yeah. So, but they try to debunk this stuff and they can't, you know, they just say you're making stuff up. And here's the thing. I was a cop. I know how investigations work. I know how to connect dots in a, in a manner which would allow me to create a case that I would present to a state attorney. And the case that I have constructed, I would write up and present to a state attorney any day and be able to defend. So, you know, I don't think it's too far fetched. It just people need to understand the CIA and their tradecraft and all the fucking mind stuff that they do and the body doubles and the aliases and the, all that stuff. That's real. And in 63, they were masters of it. Not so much today. They are all digital today. But yeah, so it was, I also think it was kind of an experiment, you know, if they would have pulled it off to see if their tradecraft tactics would have worked. And they did, obviously. I mean, they had trouble along the way. How many inquiries have there been? Like three ever since, you know, the ARB and all that stuff. So, yeah. 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 And that's a that's a, a really good point. And I guess in terms of in terms of Vanu. So like that's that's something I, I, I kind of realized um, in some of the old Vanu publications you'd have. Uh, there's an a, a, a article I just published called Buy Spy Tips for Staying Free and Effective. So it's basically like utilizing. Um, so there, there, there's some articles where, you know, these these self liberators, these freedom pioneers will basically reappropriate these spy craft tactics like using pseudonyms, um, you know, paper tripping, these sorts of tactics, mm -hmm. not to like not to like coerce people but to like to like to keep to make themselves invulnerable to the coerce or like the state and the survival society so um mm -hmm. this like going through this has been really eye-opening um for a lot of reasons because i didn't realize all the like I, I guess i hadn't really gone too deep into the spy craft and the trade craft um and these things work i mean it, it did then obviously um now they're they, you know they had to help with uh, you know stalling you know, stalling investigations and the warren commission and all that mm -hmm. um but at the same time like you look at what's like all the confusion and the chaos that this created and how much you know how how, how long it's confused people um, until you know you came along I mean it's absolutely it's absolutely wild um, with with yeah the, the I guess the effectiveness um, that's had over the past 50 60 years yeah I mean the thing that just pisses me off the most is that why did I have to do this <laughs> yeah <laughs> why the fuck did I have to do any of this I say I took you know four and a half years of my goddamn life dedicated to this you know I can't ever get those years back and this wasn't this wasn't 60 years hard this was hard it wasn't 60 years hard so mm -hmm. Yeah, just pisses me off that nobody else has done this because they should have. So I didn't have to waste those years. Not that there were ways to change my life, and I love it. And it's what I do for a living. So, mm -hmm. but at the same time, it's like I should I should not have had to do all the work that I did because somebody else should have already done it. And despite all the people who and there are, there are hundreds and thousands of books and all the millions of dollars have been generated by Kennedy's assassination, people just keep spinning it in circles over bullshit. It's really it just makes me angry. Right. Right. So I guess um, uh, to we've kind of gone through, I guess, the, the, the timeline and such. And I just uh, uh, to, to close out, I'd like to talk about bigger implications here and make a fine point on on these things. Because we talked about it a little bit, but I want to you know make make it very clear that 
<clears throat> so like the with, with the with with this with, with what transpired with what you've discovered um so like jack valente is involved um the uh um you know the, the skating rink was uh, you know connected to lbj um you have um um, and I guess this opens up into like I guess the broader Zionism conversation with um, who mm-hmm. was it that got sent off to Hollywood to run Hollywood. Um, so like there's mm-hmm. there's a lot of really big implications of, of what transpired then. So I guess Massive. we talk a little bit the about biggest that. in the world. The, to me, it's the biggest in the world. Like when people come to understand my work and who Jack Valenti is and what he did after he went to Hollywood and how he created the rating system as a sense as a mechanism of CIA censorship is what it was really. That was their way to censor movies. Um, cause back in the day, if you, in the seventies, if you got a rated R movie, you got no advertising, like none. So like, that was how they squashed films that had ideas they didn't want to promote. Um, you know, I'm convinced Jack, uh, Valenti killed Martin Luther King. Um, I still need to get to that. That'll take me, a, I figure a year to two years to knock out, but I still need, I, I'm convinced because of the relationships to Raul that Valenti was involved with that for sure. And Jack Valenti was traveling on the day that fucking Martin Luther King was killed. So give me a break. I mean, I think to me, it's it's uh, to me, it's pretty obvious because that's just because of the relationships. I don't know much on the facts surrounding the, the King case, but I will. I'll get to it. But yeah, I've just been crunching on my book. My book's about God. I got to have 350 pages done already. Um, I'd say it's mostly done. Um, I definitely have at least four or five chapters to go. And uh, once I wrap up, this, once I wrap up this chapter, I'm talking about with the chaos in Daily Plaza. Once I get done with that, like the, the last couple chapters are really just like background biographical information on some of the guys. So it's not going to be that hard to finish. Mm-hmm. I'm really fucking hoping to get it done by the end of the year. Like if I can get it done by the end of the year, I'll be super happy. Yeah, that's amazing. Uh, that's that's amazing. And, and yeah, well, um, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that a couple of times and I'll mention it, mention it too explicitly. But yeah, he, you have, you're working on a book um, coming up to coming up to the to the close. He's the 350 pages. Um, is, or I guess long. It'll long, be long. close to six or seven hundred oh, when I'm done. Oh, gosh, yeah. Okay. Well, <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Very okay. Awesome. Well, that's. Uh, I'll be. I'll be looking forward to uh, to reading that. Um, I, I definitely will be. Um, so, um, yeah. I suppose. Uh, um, I don't really have any other any other questions. Um, I appreciate you coming on. Um, and I guess just sure. in terms of my my, con- it's it's <clears throat> it's uh it's wild from from reading from. So I was kind of leaning in the direction when, you know, hearing that, that Thornley was arrested out of the theater and, you know, let go. Like, that's uh, like, yeah, again, they don't they don't, you know, let they don't, uh, you know, let Patsy's go. They, they pretty much kill him. Um, uh, it's, it's mm-hmm. usually history. So like that, 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 that was that was kind of a glaring, a glaring, like a glaring red flag for me. And then kind of hearing you, your explanation going through it. And he, he did seem kind of I mean, that's even just even the way that uh, his friends her defenders were, were were kind of presenting it like a fair case. Um, he was kind of you know back and forth. Um, he was kind of dumb and naive, and um, that that kind of you know that kind of uh, you know impression. And then he did end up going nuts. So, um, yeah, I guess uh, you've yeah you brought you've you've brought uh, a lot to, to life for me, and I'm, I'm sure for um, for for the audience too. So I guess uh, any any other any other uh, closing thoughts? Anything we didn't get to that you want to make sure to work in uh, um, in regards to what we talked about today? Um, or feel free to you know plug your no, plug your you sites or anything. My- yeah, just go to coreyhughes.org. That's where all my stuff is. Awesome, awesome. Well, uh, um, thanks a lot, Corey. It's been uh, it's been a great pleasure. And mm-hmm. uh, um, yeah, again, thanks a lot for for all of your work. Um, and, uh, and 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 I just jumped on there too. Where can people support you um, if they want to uh, you know support your research on future? Yeah, if you want, um, sure. Um, you can go to for, uh, buymeacoffee.com slash forbidden. And anybody who makes a five dollar donation or more get access to my uh, my private chat. Um, I'll get you a link to my private chat. Uh, but yeah, you can get a link to my private chat uh, if you make a donation. Uh, and we have a pretty good group in there. We have some fun. So definitely do that. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thanks again, Corey. Uh, we'll, we'll definitely be in touch. And uh, let me know if there's, uh, if there's uh, when your book comes out, if you want to come on and talk about it, uh, anything I can do to help them, I'm happy yeah, to. Yeah, for sure. So. All right, man. Thank you. I appreciate it. Hey, not a problem. Not a problem. All right, guys. And there you have it. Uh, podcast.com for everything Vanu. And uh, yeah, always remember Vanu is yours for the making and the second realm is yours for the building. Cheers. Since I first became an activist almost four decades ago, I have watched liberty trends come and go. All the while, the state grows in size and strength. I have seen the fruit of the labor of good people be taken, misdirected, and usurped, all in the name of liberty. I have observed dedicated, freedom-minded folks deceived, fooled, and robbed under the guise of liberty. Despite the intentions, these good, honest people were inadvertently advancing the cause of the state by supporting systems that underpin the Colossus. 
I have watched political deceivers who have learned that a few well-chosen words will act as dog whistles, and otherwise smart people will abandon reason and logic as they cling to a politician as if he were their favorite uncle. I have watched as libertarians and others faithfully believe the lies of politicians and would-be politicians who promise to roll back the abuses of governments or restrain the advance of governments. I watch the most successful of these politicians get wealthy, embed their family members in government or party positions, and retire without shrinking government by a single penny. And as expected, government grew, spending skyrocketed, national debts exploded, and yet more liberties were lost. Currently, there is a deafening noise from the cheers surrounding the YouTube libertarian cyber evangelists, only surpassed by the unjustified reverence, awe, and blood dedication. These holy elders of liberty can only be spoken of in praise, lest their faithful minions rain internet hate upon you for your blasphemies. Yet, the best advice these cyber evangelists and holy liberty elders can offer the freedom-minded individual is vote for me. Beg government to be nice, beg government to slightly lower spending, and beg government to audit the Fed. Like Emmanuel Goldstein guiding the Brotherhood in controlled opposition to Big Brother, those most revered in these so-called liberty movements are simply encouraging their followers to continue doing the same thing that has never worked. Namely, using the immorality and aggression of governments to make the immorality and aggression of governments somehow less immoral and less aggressive. It could pass as a hilarious sketch comedy if it weren't happening in real time around us every single day. On the other hand, something I've rarely witnessed is the freedom pioneer who is able to sidestep the personality cults, the con artists, and the windbags while sipping through the mountains of liberty publications to find the hidden jewels of truth left by the often forgotten or unsung visionaries who came before us. I'm speaking of that rare individual who can see that doing the same thing generation after generation is not a wise course and will never lead to freedom. I'm speaking of the few today who have made the conscious choice to abandon collectivist solutions, abandon faith in a liberty champion, and personally embrace fondue and self-liberation aimed at using the liberties we currently have to become as free as possible as soon as possible. In the process of compiling Vonnie with strategy for self-liberation, Shane has dug through mountains of out-of-print material and works almost lost to history. He, along with a small group of co-conspirators, have resurrected a genre of the freedom movement that had all but vanished. Shane's timing in delivering this book could not have been better. Without the baggage of these so-called liberty movements, waves of people are seeking greater freedom by embracing minimalist lifestyles in a variety of ways. From the tiny house movements, festival circuits, band nomadism, and even the RV lifestyle, People of every age and income classification are taking direct action in their lives in an attempt to free themselves from the traps of modern consumerism and the chains of the state. People are tired of simply dredging through traffic in a daily commute only to waste hours of their lives banging at a virtual feed bar in the virtual cage that we call a cubicle. As the bosses bark out orders, we all know deep inside the only reward we will see is more debt and the occasional upgrade to an overpriced phone. That is, unless we do something about it. Unless we act. Many people have also come to the same conclusion. Their problem is in knowing what to do that will directly lead them to the freedom they desire. No thinking person wants to continue doing the same thing over and over while hoping for a different result. But few people have the time and resources to research such a wide topic. What Shane provides for us in Vanu, a strategy for self-liberation, is refined information that will be extremely helpful in the decision-making process for anyone seeking the next step in freeing themselves from the self-inflicted bondage called modern society. Those in the gaming world could refer to Shane's book as a set of cheat codes, or perhaps a walkthrough, designed to show the reader a path through a wide wilderness of choices on the way to achieving a life as close to true freedom as possible today. You could spend the next 40 years of your life chasing dreams, giving your hard-earned cash to liberty cheerleaders, or convincing yourself that some politician is going to magically make government produce freedom. Or, you can cut through the hogwash and empty promises and take the actions needed to live a life as free as you can as soon as possible. I choose to stop talking, stop wishing, and stop following. I choose action. Ben Stone, April 2018. Bad Quaker Podcast. The second edition of Shane Radliff's Banu, A Strategy for Self-Liberation, releases via Liberty under a tap publication September 11th. Get the updated, updated book on Banu, and begin, or continue, your journey of liberation today. 
pre-order now, libertyunderattack.com forward slash VONU book 2. Again libertyunderattack.com forward slash VONU book 2. And always remember, Vanu is yours for the making.